thank you, Grant, for the introduction, and thank you, Jessica, for inviting me. Um, I think, as Grant said, my name is John McMillan, um, and I'm mostly a steelhead scientist working with Trout Unlimited, but uh, since 2009, I've been lucky enough to be um, uh, one of the scientists working on the Elwha Dam removal project down here in Washington State on the Olympic Peninsula. So today, I'd like to walk you through a short story basically about what we've learned uh, from Elwha Dam removal so far and kind of the lessons that we're, we're taking home from the results and data that we've collected. Um, but before I get into kind of the cool story here about the Elwha, the first thing I want to do is even though I'm the one presenting today, there are literally just a lot of scientists and biologists and technicians that have really helped collect all of the data that I'm showing you folks today. So uh, I wanna acknowledge everybody, but in particular, I work closely with the Lower Elwha Tribe and Mike McHenry, um, Mel Ellison and Ray Moses. And then, you know, at NOAA, Northwest Fishery Science Center, I've got George Pass and the Olympic National Park. I've got uh, Sam Brinkman. So there are a lot of people and I don't want to forget them all because they've just done a tremendous amount of work. So I'm literally standing on the shoulders of a lot of people. So for today, I'd like to talk a little bit and really focus in on three species, steelhead, coho, and chinook. And those are kind of the main uh, species of interest here in the Elwha for those of us that are, are focused on these fish. I will talk a little bit about bull trout at the end. So. To get at this, I want to talk a little bit about how far upstream have the fish made it since the dams have been removed, how many fish are there, and then I want to, I want to end with a little bonus slide on, on the uh, emergence of summer steelhead. So this is a map of the Elwha River Basin, and what you can see uh, in the two little yellow boxes are the locations of the two dams. Uh, the Elwha Dam is the lowermost dam, located around River Mile 5. And Glines Canyon, which is a taller dam, larger, located about River Mile 13. And neither of those dams had passage, so fish could not get upstream. And that means that basically about 90% of the accessible habitat for salmon was blocked. And that was a big deal, uh, not only because it greatly reduced the salmon and steelhead populations by about 98%, but also because it eliminated access to the headwaters of the Elwha, and the vast majority of the Elwha River is located within the boundaries of the Olympic National Park. It's considered pristine, so it's really high quality habitat. Um, to give you a little uh, breakdown here on, on, in terms of what the dams look like, this is the Elwha Dam. Um, little figure on the right kind of shows you just how much sediment was being stored behind the Elwha Dam. You know, that's the Empire State Building. We're talking almost 5 million cubic meters of sediment, right? So it was a lot of sediment. Um, and that dam was constructed in 1912. And this is what it looks like deconstructed fully in 2011 when it was passable. Uh, and the second dam is Glines Canyon, located again about River Mile 13. It's much taller than Elwha. It's holding back a lot more sediment. Uh, it was completed in 19. 27, and this is what it looks like when it was deconstructed in 2014. But as you will hear a little bit later on in the slide, this area was not completely passable in about 2000, late 2015. Um, so, you know, the big concern I think everybody had, in, including myself, is that when you remove the dams, what you're going to have is uh, a bunch of sediment come out of those former reservoirs, right, and kind of inundate and cover and create a lot of problems. Uh, for, for fish life, not only because, you know, it's going to clog their gills and makes it hard to see anything, but also because it's going to bury the substrate and kind of entomb most of those uh, macroinvertebrates, which are a big food source, as we all know, for salmon. So this is just a slide from a publication by Amy East. And on the left, you can see September 2011, before uh, the Elwha Dam was fully deconstructed. Uh, on the right there, you can see a few months later, and then you're coming back in August 2012, and what you can see is that by 2012, after only about a year, we're seeing coarsening of the sediment. So the river was transporting a lot of that fine sediment out uh, very rapidly. And the good news now is despite all of this mess, and here's a picture of the former, one of the former reservoirs, and this is uh, shortly after the dam had been deconstructed. And you can see all the mud and silt along these banks. Uh, you can see the old forest that was there. And of course, you know, this did take a toll. I think we talked about this, that immediately after dam removal, when we were out electrofishing and shocking, and there's a scientist with NOAA, and we basically found that about 98% um, of the fish, um, you know, there's about a 98% to 99% reduction in the abundance of fish below the dams. And there was a similar reduction in macroinvertebrates. So 
there was a lot of mortality associated with those sediment pulses that moved through. I want to give folks a sense here. This is just a uh, video, and it never seems to play over Zoom. So uh, this is just a flood that happened in one of the old lake bed reservoirs. And basically what you can see is that, you know, the river was really tearing through all of this sediment that had graded behind those reservoirs and then was transporting it downstream. But during that period of time, of course, it created kind of a murky mess. Now, one of the very cool things is that although the river was moving all of the sediment, we didn't realize that these old lake beds had former forests on them. So, you know, right before they built the dams, they went in and logged it. And in here, you can see the actual buckboard cuts that are still in this old cedar stump. And these stumps have become very important because they're all over the old lake beds. And uh, basically, they're helping store sediment and create pools and trap wood. And I'll show you a photo of that in a bit. And of course, once the summer came, you know, all of that mud and silt dried up and it, and it kind of resembled, you know, like one of those desert landscapes. Uh, but again, just a lot of this wood, you know, these stumps were actually helping trap wood that was moving downstream. And this is just a, a more panoramic shot of one of the old reservoirs showing that relic stump forest. And so that added some cool stuff to, um, to the project. Now, people wonder how did the fish survive during dam removal below, you know, in the lower five miles of river when, when things were all kind of going to hell in a handbasket, you know. Uh, and there are a couple of small um, clear water spring-fed creeks that enter. And these are very small. In fact, this one here is located at the mouth of a hatchery. But what we saw was that most adult steelhead, Chinook and Coho, were moving into these very clear water areas that were kind of serving as a refugia from that high turbidity in the main stem. And they were spawning in there. And so, you know, it's like basically almost all the fish that were spawning during dam removal uh, and during that worst period of sedimentation before the dams were out, were spawning in these clear water areas below the dams. Um, now, one of the cool things is the sediment just didn't create havoc and, and do a lot of bad things and, and just have negative effects on the fish. Um, there was a really cool thing, which is the sediment resulted in uh, enlargement of a delta. And this delta at the mouth of the Elwha has created a lot of nearshore habitat uh, for juvenile salmonids and Yulacan. So it's been fun to see this really broad expansion of uh, delta at the mouth of the Elwha that formerly didn't exist when the dams were out. Uh, and the other cool thing is, is now we're sitting here 10 years after dam removal. This shot was seven years after dam removal and just showing the, the, the large amount of woody debris that got transported down through the system and then aggregated in these channels, helping create pools and ripples. And if you remember those stump forests I talked about, here we are again, eight to 10 years later, and those stumps uh, collecting wood and some of them scouring out and tumbling down river. Well, a lot of adult fish and juvenile fish are now using those stumps as cover. And so the big question is though, is, is just how is recolonization for salmonids going above the dams? And this is the picture of the upper, upper Elwha in the national park, beautiful and, and untouched. And so um, the first thing I wanna do is just talk about how we how fish recolonize because there are two ways and so in 2011 before the dams were fully out we relocated uh, hatchery and wild adult coho salmon and hatchery and wild steelhead up above the dams into a couple of clear water tributaries that served as refugia and the and the, and the goal was to kind of jumpstart the colonization process now we stopped relocating uh, those fish in 2018 and everything since then has been natural colonization for those species. Um, and there was also natural colonization occurring simultaneously as we were moving fish upstream. And so for us to get a sense of, you know, just where these fish are going in terms of recolonization, we used a, a number of methods, of course, including red counts where we could see in the, in the clear tributaries. We also used snorkel surveys in those tribs. And then as the river is cleared over time, we've, we've started to increase our ability to use snorkel surveys in the main Elwha. But we're also uh, initially, especially during that time when a lot of sediment was being transported downstream, we relied heavily on radio telemetry to kind of track fish movements throughout the system. And here is just a photograph of two wild steelhead with the radio transmitters on their back being released into the Elwha. And here are, um, this is actually the first picture of a steelhead in the middle 
that made it up to a uh, tributary on its own. And so Ray Moses and I, um, he is a, a biologist with the Lower Elwha tribe. We moved uh, several steelhead into a creek and we floy tagged those fish. You can't see the tag on the other side here, but basically um, almost immediately within about 24 to 36 hours, we had two other steelhead move into the creek and approach and try and mate with the, the fish that we had moved up there. So that was cool. We assumed that they were probably picking up on pheromones maybe that those fish had released. Uh, and so again, the question is just how far upstream have these fish gone? And so I'm going to show you here on the left is the map of the Elwha, both, both maps and both panels. The left panel is for steelhead and the right panel is for coho. And so what you can see here is that during that very first phase of recolonization, that steelhead moved up into Little River, which is a tributary um, there. And then there's a, a tributary adjacent immediately across called Indian Creek. They went up there a little ways. Uh, they moved up the main stem a few miles. And, and so, you know, literally they started to recolonize very rapidly. But more strikingly is just within basically two years, the, the coho adults were occupying almost all of the habitat within that middle Elwha you know, below the former Glimes Canyon Dam, which was not removed at this point. And so literally it took only about two seasons for the coho to expand their distribution that rapidly. And so here we kind of are moving up to year three now. And what you can see is Glimes Canyon Dam, of course, is still a blockage. Um, the coho distribution has expanded a little bit into one other uh, small tributary, but basically remained the same because they were using almost all the habitat and by year three, you have steelhead, the distribution almost matching that of coho. And as we go up further, year five, Glines Canyon is now passable. And we're not seeing coho uh, at year five really make it through that old Glines Canyon site. But we are seeing steelhead uh, begin to penetrate further into the watershed. And one of the reasons that it took fish a while to get through Glines Canyon is because there was a rock fall that occurred when they were blasting or removing the dam. So George Paz and some other folks got a lot of money and they went in and redynamited those rocks to get them out of the way and create passage. And this is just kind of a, a photo series from left to right. You know, as you can see the pre-rock fall, the rock fall velocity barrier, and then the uh, post-rock fall. And I think it was a lot of fun for the explosive people to kind of blast that thing out of there. And so once that was fully passable, uh, again, we saw steelhead penetrate way, way up upstream into um, the headwaters of the Elwha. And Coho started to then finally make it past that Glines Canyon Dam site. And so uh, Coho didn't make it as far upstream as Steelhead and they still haven't. But what we can see here is, is, is kind of a comparative, uh, very similar figure for Chinook. And so again, and, and Chinook's distribution has taken a similar path to Steelhead. They're not penetrating quite up as far into the headwaters of the Elwha as the steelhead have. And I won't get into that today, but there's questions. We are uncertain about how many Chinook actually made it through some of these really hard to navigate canyons into the headwaters. So the other question is for us is how do you actually enumerate fish during this kind of sediment storm? And so uh, Keith Denton uh, is a scientist that works out here and he worked with George Pess at NOAA and Mike McKendry and they decided to tap into this Sonar technology, of course, Alaska has been using it for decades. And so basically we have two sonar units that are installed um, in the lower Elwha River. And this map shows kind of where the sonar units are located because there are two channels at the mouth of the Elwha. And these sonar units are running 24 hours a day, every day of the week during the season, except for high water when we have to remove them. Uh, but sonar has been a big help for us because there would not have been any other way to, to enumerate fish. And so this is a plot of abundance of Chinook salmon and steelhead uh, before dam removal, during dam removal, and then after dam removal. And the signal is nice, right? I mean, this is a, a hopeful signal. We're starting to see an increase in both Chinook salmon and steelhead populations. And in fact, um, in the last couple of years, we've basically had some record run sizes for Chinook salmon in the Elwha, and the steelhead uh, are not only increasing in abundance, but also increasing their spatial distribution, and they're expanding their spawn timing. So all those are, are kind of positive things that we're seeing. And this is just a, a map that shows 
the distribution of reds. And so we consider the lower Elwha to be that chunk of river that was below the Elwha Dam, the lower five miles. The middle Elwha is the eight miles from the lower Elwha Dam up to the former Glines Canyon Dam. And the upper Elwha is the upper 60 miles of the watershed above that uh, upper Glines Canyon Dam. And so what you can see is that, you know, initially, you know, and of course, pre-dam removal, all the reds down in the lower river, but you can see fish started to recolonize. We started to relocate fish. They started to get past Elwha Dam. The red numbers really increased in that middle Elwha to the point where they were exceeding what we'd observed in the lower Elwha. And now what we see is a signal after Glines Canyon was fully removed, right? We're starting to see this increase in the number of reds way high up in that high elevation headwaters of the Elwha. So all these are suggesting a positive signal and um, this here is for steelhead, but again, I wanna just kind of go back and forth and we're basically seeing the same pattern in steelhead that we see in Chinook, you know, which is more reds in the middle river. And now in the last three to four years, we're seeing an increase in the number of reds uh, up in the high parts of the Elwha River. And so these are the uh, population estimates that we have for out migrating juvenile Chinook. So, Joe Anderson is a scientist with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and him and others have been tracking um, the, the success because all of the Chinook salmon that we had to help recolonize in the Elwha were hatchery origin. And we were unsure how well they would perform, how fast they might, how, how long it might take them uh, to be successful. And uh, to no surprise, those fish have really struggled to produce natural origin uh, Chinook smolts, when the, um, when the river has been kind of reaching its normal state. So, you know, the gravel, there was so much small sediment and fine sediment, the channel became really dynamic. And Chinook are mostly main stem spawners. And because a lot of the spawning was occurring below the uppermost dam site, they were susceptible and being exposed to this dynamic channel, the fine sediment moving through. But now finally, as of about 2019, the sediment uh, dynamics in the main stem Elwha are considered to be a background level by the geomorphologist working in the basin. And once that happened, we saw this dramatic signal where there's been a really big increase in the number of naturally produced Chinook salmon smolts. And that number is actually twice as high uh, for 2020 as it is on here. And I just didn't have time to include that, uh, that data point. So, basically going from very, very small numbers of, of naturally produced out migrating Chinook to a really good number. So that's exciting to see also, because it does suggest that as the river conditions stabilize, these fish are starting to kind of catch their wind and be more successful. And we're basically seeing a similar signal for steelhead, uh, except that we are seeing more natural production in steelhead early in the stages of dam removal than we did for Chinook. And the most likely reason for that is twofold, is one, a lot of steelhead are spawning in tributaries that were not directly impacted by dam removal. And a number of steel, a, a number of steelhead, a much greater proportion of them are getting above both of the dams to habitats where they never experienced any of the effects of dam removal. Uh, but in any case, you can see that prior to dam removal, very few natural produced smolts for steelhead. Now we're seeing a dramatic increase in that, which is all really helpful. And so this is just kind of a timeline since dam removal, uh, adding up steelhead, Chinook, and coho salmon, and in terms of the total reds that we've seen in different places in the basin. And so again, it's just a positive signal. It doesn't mean we're out of the woods, but it means that, you know, right now in the early stages of dam removal, uh, steelhead, Chinook, and coho are starting to kind of catch their tailwinds. Um, but it's not just about adults. Uh, juveniles are also helping recolonize different habitats and uh, especially coho. And so this is kind of cool. Uh, this is Little River, which is one of our intensively monitored tributaries in the basin. And we census reds uh, for adult coho, and that's a distribution of reds in Little River moving from the mouth at river kilometer zero all the way up to 4.7 at an anadromous barrier. And what you see in there, there's, there's a bunch of gaps where the coho didn't spawn. We came back in in the following summer and did snorkel surveys over the same reach. You can see that almost all those gaps that formerly existed where the reds were at had been filled in 
And that's because these juvenile coho are dispersing from the areas where they were spawned and occupying habitat where the adults didn't spawn. So that's been um, kind of an enlightenment for us too, is just how much the juveniles are moving around and, and occupying habitat. Uh, but I think the biggest surprise that we've seen in the Elwha has been the return of summer steelhead. Uh, there's a picture on the left, and this is Eleanor Chittenden, and that's about a 13-pound Elwha summer run she caught in 1907. Um, I was lucky enough in October 2012 to run into the first summer steelhead that we were able to document above Elwha Dam, and I actually had my camera with me and was able to get a photo, so I felt pretty lucky. Uh, but the cool thing is, is that prior to dam removal, there were very, very few adult summer steelhead that we observed in the basin. You can see in the little box, and some of those fish uh, were clipped. And so we were never even sure whether those summer runs that were clipped, they were clearly from a different place because we're not releasing hatchery uh, summer steelhead in the Elwha. So prior to dam removal, maybe one, two, three adults a year. Some years we didn't see any adults. And so on the bottom now we have another figure. It shows 2016, the National Park, uh, actually the National Park went up and, and did a short survey and they counted about 20 fish. And so that emboldened them in 2017, they went back and surveyed about twice the amount of habitat. Uh, and they counted, I think about 70 to 80 steelhead. And so once we got that signal for 70 to 80, uh, Sam Brinkman at the National Park and others, uh, including us at TU, convened a group to put together a, a riverscape survey, which is basically survey as much of the main stem as we could. And that survey counted, um, revealed about 220 steelhead in 2019, which was our peak count year. We ended up with a count of about 330 steelhead. And those numbers have declined. I don't have last year's number on there. It dropped off to about 200 fish. And uh, to be clear, these are just the raw snorkel estimates. And I want to put this in context because uh, that 330 fish that we counted in 2000. Uh, 19, we used a mark recite method. So we floy tagged a bunch of adults and then came back and snorkeled through. And our, our population estimate is basically right around 900 to 1,000 steelhead. So to put that in context, the Elwha, only five years after these fish having access to the upper watershed, within five years, the Elwha wild summer run steelhead population is the single largest summer steelhead population we have on the Olympic Peninsula, and it's likely the biggest population of wild summer runs that we have on the entire Washington coast. So that's kind of a cool thing. I kind of refer to it as like the phoenix rising from the ashes. So in summary, if we kind of take a step back and look at this, you know, steelhead, literally they're moving further upstream with each year. They've probably penetrated upstream as far as they can at this point. Now it's about building abundance and diversity. Um, the summer runs are now over 20 miles above Glines Canyon, and just to give you a sense, it's very hard for us to get into the backcountry to do these snorkel surveys. We have to hire mules and hike in about 15 to 25 miles. You know, it's a very remote area. Uh, the coho immediately expanded their distribution really quickly, much faster than any of the other fish, and those juveniles help fill in gaps. Um, in, in distribution uh, in places that the adults did not use, but they're not penetrating uh, as high into the watershed. And that's kind of expected because there are a number of difficult canyons for fish to navigate. There may be velocity barriers. Now, Chinook, which are kind of the, the big sexy fish that a lot of folks here think about because the Elwha is renowned for its large body Chinook. Well, so far their distribution is similar to steelhead. They're increasingly moving upstream we haven't seen them penetrate quite as deep into the headwaters, but there are a few making it up there. And most importantly for Chinook is the natural production is really ramping up since the river uh, has stabilized. And so I wanna talk about the, a couple of species here too, which are, you know, it's been a big boon for Pacific lamprey. There were very few lamprey in the system prior to dam removal. Uh, in the same year as the dams were um, deconstructed, we saw a lot of lamprey moving up and now we're literally seeing thousands and thousands of juvenile lamprey. We're watching them and catching them in our smolt traps as they move out to become smolts. And bull trout, uh, they were scarce below the dams prior to removal. There were bull, were bull trout above the dams. They immediately resumed uh, anadromy and now the fish are larger in size and they're older. And so the population has not only increased in abundance and distribution, uh, but in terms of diversity, the fish are older and larger, which is a, a benefit for those fish. 
And then lastly, I'll stop with one of my favorite little river creatures, which are the arrival of marine derived nutrients into the middle Elwha tributaries has not only benefited the fish and the insects, it's also benefited the dippers. And you can see here that the female uh, dippers um, uh, were able to uh, put on more fat and more mass and have uh, be more reproductively successful uh, or more reproductively fit during these periods. They were producing more offspring. I think they were having double clutches more likely. And so literally that is it. Um, these are a couple of Chinook salmon. Um, I would say this, what I think about is the Elwha is a very special place. And if I could go back to one thing, it's like all of us talk about if the dams just would never have been put in, we wouldn't have to go through all this work now. And so I always want to remind people, it's very hard to clean up. You know, it takes a lot more time, money and effort to clean up um, you know, and fix an action that was harmful to the fish than it is to just not take that action in the first place. And that's it. And thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, John. That's a, a really interesting uh, situation that's happening there. And I really appreciate your insight into it all. Um, so right now we're going to open it up to uh, questions. After each session, we'll have some time allotted for a question and answer. Uh, so you can just submit your question in the chat and then uh, we'll ping it over to the presenter. Um, yeah, so one of our first questions we have is, uh, do you know what the estimated cost for the, the total of these dam removals was? Great question. So initially it was about $365 million and it's, it's hovered around that. I think we, <clears throat> I think the park may have saved 10 or 20 million, but somewhere in that 350 range, yeah. And so if you were to go back to the beginning of this entire dam removal process and do it over again, what would you do differently? You know, uh, I don't, you know, that's a great question. <clears throat> so I, I think actually this is one of the cases where there were so many good scientists working on it and the park was being guided they were really listening, you know what I mean, to the scientists at the time. I think everything went about as well as you could plan. Now, there are a couple of things like the rock fall that we had at a dam, you know, and this is one of the challenges with dam removal is you, <clears throat> you put, and, and that's probably the one issue that we could have corrected is that <clears throat> the, the construction crew that was out there to, you know, the demolition crew that was out there to remove that upper dam, um, they got sent home because we thought the dam was deconstructed and it was passable. And it took us a year to realize that that was not passable to fish. And we had to use radio telemetry. So there's about a two year delay there in fish getting past that location. Um, but really that's it. I think that, you know, most of the stuff has gone pretty smoothly and, and it's been a really exciting to see the natural production take off for Chinook lately. And you mentioned uh, the role of, of hatchery fish and repopulating uh, this river. Um, that's always a contentious I issue. Uh, so in, in retro uh, spect, do, do you think that this could have been done without hatchery, hatcheries at all? Yeah, I think, uh, I think for Chinook and Coho, I, I think, you know, those would have struggled because literally we just didn't have another source of fish. And so that six to seven year period where the main stem Elwha was so degraded and so full of sediment and silt, I think it would have been very hard uh, for the fish to, you know, rebound as quickly as they have without those hatchery fish. Now, for steelhead, it's a little bit different because steelhead, we had a lot of resident rainbow trout that were sequestered and landlocked above the dams. And it looks genetically right now like a lot of these summer steelhead are actually coming from former resident rainbow trout that were located up in the headwaters. So that's cool. I mean, maybe there is a lesson here that if you don't have a resident form, uh, that's kind of located above the dams to help, you know, jumpstart recolonization, um, that, that hatcheries could be, you know, a stopgap measure to get you from point A to B. And I would say in this case, what is, what is nice to see is that it's literally taken, uh, George Pest likes to call it cumulative action. So we've had a, a fishery moratorium on the Elwaf now for 10 years. So nobody's been fishing. So even though the hatchery fish are coming in, there's nobody fishing for them. And we can see that the, the closure of the fishery has boosted the number of adults that we've gotten back. So 
I go back to, I, I respect the tribe's point of view on this to want to use hatcheries. I think for steelhead, you probably could have gotten away with just natural recolonization, but I think the salmon uh, would have struggled. In fact, we've seen the non-hatchery species of salmon struggle a bit. The chum and the pink just have not kind of, you know, had that consistent source of adults. So it's always a challenge. I think wild fish, you know, is the ultimate goal here, and we're working towards that. And, and steelhead probably could have done this on their own, but I think the Chinook and Coho would have struggled. And so kind of in that same arena, do you recall how many fish were re relocated to encourage recolonization? Yeah, you know, each year we relocated between 100 to 600 adult coho up into uh, the creeks. And, but for steelhead, it was small numbers, 5 to 20 a year, very small numbers. Gotcha. And we didn't move Chinook or any of the other species, yeah, so. And, and so I, I know across the Pacific Northwest, there have been other uh, dam removal projects. Uh, what would you say kind of separates the LWA or what makes it different? And what are those variables that, that you have seen, um, at least from what you're able to, to see? Yeah, you know, I uh, there were two dams removed down in, by where I grew up in the Columbia River, one in the White Salmon and another small one on the Wind River. And I've got to kind of watch those. I think the, the difference in the LWA is the sheer size and volume, you know, of water. And, and the size of the basin is, is different. You know, most of the other dam removals that have occurred to date that I'm aware of and I've experienced on the West Coast have been smaller scale stuff, right? It's not been this really big scale. Now the Klamath will, will exceed this dam removal project in terms of just sheer size. Uh, but I think that's what makes it unique. And the fact that we have literally all five species of Pacific salmon, plus char, um, steelhead, cutthroat, you know, bull trout, we have a really diverse complex, um, you know, assemblage of salmonids, but I go back to just the size of the watershed and the amount of sediment that came down. You know, I'm always shocked, like we had that big rain, rainfall that came through, you know, here the last two days and the Elwha flooded pretty badly. Um, and it's just uh, really interesting to watch a large river move that much sediment that rapidly. And do you know if there has, uh been the same kind of general results for other uh, projects uh, around for other dam removal projects? Yeah, you know, so this is a great question. Mo most of the most of the dam removal projects that, that I'm aware of that have occurred to date have been in such small streams that they, they tend to not have the diversity of salmon that we have. So like the the white salmon and the wind river dam removals on Trout Creek were basically benefiting summer steelhead. And so, but in both those cases, very similar results, right? And, and hatcheries were not used in those cases. And what you saw is just this kind of really rapid expansion with fish moving upstream past those dams, literally within months, right? Of those dams being removed. So, and I think this is normal. I think that it works with salmon's evolutionary history. You know, they went through, evolved through volcanism and ice ages and, and big floods and, and all of these crazy things. And so I think that they're explorers by nature to some degree, right? And so that was the fun part in all the dam removal is to go in before and see them kind of butting their head up against the dam. And then as soon as it's removed, you know, they're just like shooting right through. So um, it looks like the, you know, the findings are similar for steelhead. It will be interesting in the Klamath to compare what happens with Chinook, you know? And you shared so many great uh, data visualizations and whatnot that show the progression and recovery of the river uh, so far. Uh, but what do you kind of prioritize as an indicator of success in, in these types of projects? Well, that's a great question. So uh, a lot of scientists got together before the dam removal project was out and came up with an adaptive management plan. So. Basically, uh, we have goals that are set up for these fish to achieve in terms of run size and productivity. Um, and so success is having those fish achieve those goals to the point that you could eliminate the hatchery production, right? And you could have all wild production of fish. And we're not there yet. And this is kind of the cool part is some species are, are doing this really rapidly and others are taking a while. And there's that spectrum, you know, of, of how fast and quickly they progress. And so we can envision that some of these species are gonna meet their, you know, achieve those goals.
sooner than others, but we do have a number of population, you know, estimate goals that were set up and productivity estimates. And once, once fish achieve those within this biological opinion that we have, we can kind of, you know, ring the, ring the bell and say, okay, we're good here. We got to still keep monitoring, right? But they've gotten, they've gotten over the hump. So I hope that helps. And, and to follow up on that, a lot of times uh, goals are kind of set on historical data. Um, but obviously it's very different when you have a giant dam that's changed everything. So how is that process? Uh, okay, I guess, yeah, just what was that process for establishing those goals? Yeah, great, great question, Grant. So we did use historic estimates, right? We went back to uh, adjacent watersheds on the Olympic Peninsula and used data for some other places in Puget Sound and basically said, okay, per watershed size, that have used or generated historical estimates. So we tried to do that. Um, I think it was a, a pretty good job. You know, there's always, you're, you're wildly uncertain because we don't know what existed 200 years ago, but, it, but you're, you're correct in that we just generated some historical estimates for how many fish we thought were there. And we kind of have stepping stones, right? So you don't expect fish, you know, to all of a sudden get up to that goal, but there are a couple of stepping stones to where you can adaptively manage as these fish incrementally become more successful. Awesome. And you had it on part of the slide, but can you kind of uh, elaborate on the role, or I guess the extent of lamprey in the watershed. Yeah, so lamprey are cool. We had a few lamprey below the the, the Elwad Dam before the dams were out. But and, and lamprey, this has been fun to learn. You know, lamprey require a lot of fine sediment for their juveniles to rear in, and they go down and sit in that five sediment for five to six years before they head out. So they really need this. And because the dams blocked off sediment transport, the sediment size was coarsened down below the dam. And there was very little fine sediment or habitat where lamprey could spawn and then their juveniles could rear. And this has been the fun part is we unleashed all of that fine sediment. And there's a lot of it. And so we are seeing huge increases in lamprey. I can tell people that we go out and electroshock a lot of the watershed and every time you turn on the shocker, you're pulling uh, quite a few amacetes out, which are juvenile lamprey. We see thousands upon thousands of them in the smolt traps in the creek. So lamprey appear to be doing really well, and that's kind of exciting to see. There are a lot of them in the watershed. In fact, I would harbor to guess that that might be the most abundant juvenile outside of the, the micus that we have in the system. And so with... Um... Chinook specifically, uh, in your opinion, do you think that um, if you were to transport some further upstream that they would repopulate that area uh, quicker rather than just the natural progression forward? Yeah, that's been a debated topic here. Should we move fish, should we move Chinook to the upper watershed? Now here is the challenge. We are not sure whether these were spring Chinook. Right now they're summer Chinook. And so summer Chinook come in late enough in the season from an evolutionary standpoint that it's probably, even though we've seen some up there, there's not a lot of volitional colonization to that upper part. And part of that reason is there's a five mile canyon called Grand Canyon. And for anybody who's a whitewater kayaker, it's class five. This is basically the most difficult canyon we have in any coastal river in the lower 48. It's so dangerous that we're not even allowed to snorkel it. And so, it seems to me that that is probably a barrier to summer Chinook salmon because it's just so far up in the watershed. Now, the question is, did we have spring Chinook? Because spring Chinook would likely penetrate that high. We're not sure that they could actually, I'm not certain that spring Chinook could make it up that high in the watershed because of the, the flow barriers that could occur in Grand Canyon when spring Chinook are coming in, combined with the cold water temperatures. There are Best that we can see, there are historical records of steelhead, summer steelhead, above the uh, uh, Grand Canyon in the headwaters, but we have not seen a single winter steelhead get up that pie. Now, the summer runs were noted by homesteaders in the late 1800s as being there in these pools. The strange thing is there's no record of homesteaders ever seeing any Chinook up high in the watershed, and I think that in, you know, summer low flows, they would have easily seen Chinook, so it might be 
that this is kind of a, a situation where the Chinook just didn't naturally get up that far. And the hard part with relocating them, as we found, is every time you move a hatchery fish somewhere up higher into the watershed, about a third to half of them immediately swim back downstream to the hatchery. <laughs> they don't want to be there. And so, you know, the other challenge is we do need fish to get up there volitionally because those fish have the, the right timing of migration and the physical fitness to ascend those difficult canyons. And so we're hoping that it can happen naturally if it is going to happen. We're not sure. It might just be that, you know, that upper headwater is predominantly a place for bull trout and summer steelhead. It's going to be fun to, you know, to see this unfold over the next 10 years to see what happens. You, you shared a slide about the monitoring and with the sonars. And uh, as everyone in Alaska knows, that that's not something that runs itself. So what is the long-term uh, monitoring plan for that? So it's a great question. Our monitoring funding is literally drying up now 10 years, uh, you know, post, you know, 10 years at, at which we started the project. So the monitoring money is greatly reduced now. It's been difficult. Uh, the sonar, the sonars are going to keep running. The tribe has enough money to make that happen and the park and NOAA assist. Um, but it's getting tougher to raise money for monitoring. There's not a bunch of money. It's all basically dwindled now to the point where, you know, they've had to lay off some folks in the national park and things like that. So a concern for us moving forward is how do we kind of prioritize what we monitor now and how do we make, uh, make do with less? right it's it's not going to be easy and i think all all my friends and colleagues that are biologists and scientists can relate to this right you, you do these big projects and you hope there's plenty of money because people want to learn about the lessons um and so it's going to be a, a a tight one you know for a couple years here i think but the plan is to keep going right the plan is just to continue monitoring no fishery is open yet so we've got to you know under the biop and these and these other kind of federal things to Chinook or ESA listed and Steelhead R2, you know, were mandated to, to collect and, mon you know, collect some data and monitor to make sure these fish achieve their goals that were outlined in the, in the biop. And so bu building on that, uh, with the sonar, uh, what's the method that they use for determining which fish going past is which species? Because as you mentioned, there's oh, a diverse yeah. array of, of fish passing through that. Yeah, that's a great question. So we use species co composition sampling. Uh, once a week, uh, we go out with a seine and you sample, you know, um, the river right in the vicinity of the sonar to collect adults and you use that ratio and apply it to the fish that are moving by. That's, that's one of the ways, but the sonar for us can also give us a rough measure of size. So the size uh, measure on there helps. And the cool thing though, is that, uh, Trout Unlimited, um, one of our chapter members, we have a grant that we got through Amazon and we're working with Caltech and we're partnered with Alaska uh, Fish and Game. We're trying to, you know, Amazon and Caltech are trying to automate the sonar counting process using artificial intelligence. And it's, uh, we're about two years into that. It looks like it's working out pretty well for the draft model so far. You know, there's more tuning to it. So I expect over the next four to five years, we're going to have a, a machine learning tool that automates the sonar counting process, which should not only help us reduce, you know, the manual effort required to count this, uh, but the hope is it can get us eventually to species. Because if anybody goes home and just Googles uh, uh, camera, artificial intelligence and fish farms, if you look at all these fish farms, you're using cameras where they can identify each fish as an individual just based on facial markings. So I, I envision some point four to five years down the road, we've got a little bit better means of distinguishing species, but right now we have to go out and do it by hand, you know, manually sampling adults in the vicinity to get a proportion of the fish that are moving by. And this is possible because the sonars are located about river mile 0.75. They're almost at the mouth of the river. So again, following along with that, I know different places have different techniques uh, for example, some places in Alaska have a fish wheel that they use uh, for that uh, apportionment. How accurate do you feel that uh, the staining works for um, giving you good data? It's a great question. So we use sonar 
mostly we use sonar to count uh, summer Chinook and then winter steelhead. And those are the first two. And so winter steelhead are kind of nice because there's almost no other species coming in during that period of time, except for bull trout. So for winter steelhead, we, we feel pretty certain that it's really getting uh, a good estimate. And uh, for Chinook, uh, the early part of the Chinook season, they don't really start entering until uh, May to June, again, after most of the steelhead have stopped entering. So the early part of the Chinook run is pretty clear. It's just kings. But once you get into uh, you know, late August and early September, there can be a bit of overlap with coho. But we've been fortunate so far to basically have these two runs of fish that are moving up during times when there's not a lot of other species outside of bull trout. And bull trout are generally smaller than the other two species so we can distinguish them with sonar. Now, I would defer to Keith Denton. I think he thinks it works pretty well. But again, you know, we've got to test this, which is one of, going to be one of the fun things with, you know, this machine learning tool. Are there ways that we can, you know, differentiate species using these high resolution sonar images? Um, so right now, I can't say that I have a quantitative certainty over how good it is. Uh, but my hunch is it's, you know, it's good enough for what we're doing right now. But if you want to start managing at a, at a different resolution for harvest, maybe you need, uh, you know, better data. So up until this point, uh, we've been very kind of in, in the weeds and uh, technical scientific terms, but just on a more uh, human level, you've been working on this for a, a long time. What has been uh, the, the most surprising uh, thing that you have discovered or seen? I'd say there's two things and they both fit in. So the first time that we had Chinook get up past the second dam, uh, most of Port Angeles, the town that I live next to here, it's a small town, about 15,000 people. It's, it's, a, it's a mill town, right? You know, it's a logging town. That's what it's historically traditionally been. And of course, the mills are going away and the logging, you know, is not what it once was. And so, but that old tradition was here. They wanted, most of the people in Port Angeles wanted the dams to remain in place. A lot of them did. And you would drive along and see like, keep the dams in place and all these nasty signs. And so after dam removal, when the Chinook first made it up, there was a, we took photos and there was a, a report in the local paper that said Chinook salmon made it up. And immediately, most of the responses were, those are rainbow trout from the lakes. And I'm like, well, are you serious? The rainbow trout in the lakes, we know peaked at about 17 inches. These are like 25 pound fish, right? So it's just the denial immediately, right? And some of that denial remains to today. But the exciting part was uh, about six years after that, we were walking up, uh, up the river and we ran into one of these guys who we know has been against dam removal. And he was looking at all the Chinook salmon spawning and he turns around to us, he says, I can't believe it worked. I can't believe I was wrong. And so that's the thing, you know, people underestimate nature. And if this is one thing, it's given me hope. And so the, the take home for me in this from a human level is this is one of the few places, you know, I, I'm an angler, like a fifth generation angler in Washington. And, Every generation of us has grown up with the, with the dad saying, you're a generation too late. You know what I mean? The fish are just going downhill. And the awesome thing here is if somebody can sit there with a young son or girl, a tribal person, a recreational angler and say, look, in 20 years, you're going to have better fishing in this watershed um, than we've had for the last hundred years. There's going to be more fish. And so, you know, I, th I think about that and it's not just about fishing, right? It's a, you know, there's value, intrinsic value in having these animals be healthy. But I think that's the fun part is to watch some of the people have to suck it up and eat crow that, you know, fought so hard against the dam removal and then see the realization sink in that it's working um, and then have to kind of accept that. that that's a really uh, encouraging and inspiring uh, little anecdote. And so I'll put it just a one uh, last call for questions for John. Um, but uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and expertise. It is uh, fascinating to see such massive transformations uh, in, in a landscape and really encouraging results so far. Um, so seeing no further questions, we will head to break a little bit early, but a few quick announcements. Uh, coming up later this afternoon, we have a couple slots open uh, for tidbits. Those are the three minute or shorter announcements or updates. Uh, so if you have a project or anything that you want to provide an update on, uh, we have um, I think just a, like three or four spots available. Please email uh, Libby Kugel. Um, her email is 
lkugel at greatlandtrust.org um, to get on that list. We're not able to add any PowerPoint slides at this point, um, but you can still get in and share a little bit of news. And then also we have just five spots remaining for our communicating data and science to non-scientists -sci workshop tomorrow. That's with uh, Kathy Angel Communications. If you go to our website, matsusalmon.org, it'll be the first thing that you see on our homepage. So if you're interested in, interested in that, that's tomorrow at 1.30 and it goes until 3 p.m. And we're excited to be able to offer that for free uh, thanks to the sponsors of the symposium. So with that, we will take a break um, and we will resume at uh, 10.40 just to give us a little bit ahead of, a little bit of extra time for our next session so we can get a few more uh, questions and answers in with our next batch of presenters. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll see you shortly. And thanks again, John, for, for sharing your work. Yeah, thanks a lot, Grant. It was great. Thank you to everyone.